this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. Hey there, it's John Warlow. Listen, if you're brand new to Built to Sell Radio, welcome. It's good to have you along for the ride. We've been doing this show now for five years. I've interviewed literally a different entrepreneur every week for the past five years, and I've taken some of their best practices, their, their tips and tricks and negotiation hacks, and distilled them all into a field guide. It's a book called The Art of Selling your business. And it is a little bit of a recipe card for you to punch above your weight when it comes to negotiating with an acquirer. You can get it at builttosell.com slash selling. Fun story coming up with Ben and Ariel Zweifler, who started a business called Pup Box after they have a puppy and realized that other people might need help training their puppy and getting age appropriate toys and food and training, etc throughout the life cycle of their puppy's new journey. And it was a subscription box. And so this episode is chock full of recurring revenue insights. So if you've got a transactional business model and you're thinking of moving to subscription, listen up because Ben and Ariel will describe some of the key metrics, some of the tips and tricks of moving to a subscription offering. You'll also hear some interesting insights about what it's like to negotiate with the Fortune 500 giant. Petco was the ultimate acquirer for Pup Box, and you'll hear some of the ins and outs, pros and cons of selling to a large enterprise organization. Why it's important to negotiate a VP title, which is the first I've heard of that and very interesting insight. What you can guarantee in your earnout, the things in, that you need to guarantee, frankly, to make sure you can hit your earnout. Lots more to come when you hear this interview with Ben and Ariel. Enjoy. Ben and Ariel, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We, this is the second husband and wife team we've done in like a month. So this is great. I'm really excited about it. Uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be talking about this episode because... I had a chance to read up on your story beforehand, and my son is a big Shark Tank fan. And so I'm like, guess what, buddy? I get to actually interview someone's been on Shark Tank. And he's like, oh, cool. What are you going to ask him? And so we had this big yeah. back and forth about what should I ask the guys from Shark Tank? So tell us about this company, Pup Box. What, what did you guys do? Yeah, so um, we started the company back in 2014. Essentially, we started the company when we got our first dog, Maggie. She was a she was a golden doodle, and she was a eight week old puppy. And we were, you know, young couple, no kids. And Maggie became like the center of our life. She, we treated her like she was our first daughter, um, and we were obsessed with her. We wanted to get her the best products. We tried to take her to all the best training classes. But honestly, it was just kind of a disjointed experience. We didn't know what to do. We we're constantly searching for content and training information, but it was a lot of like conflicting information. So we started Pup Box to kind of mitigate this um, disjointed puppy process. And what it is, it's a subscription box. And every month you get a box that contains five to seven products and a training guide. And everything's targeted to your puppy's specific age and months and physical characteristics. And it really helps and walks the new puppy owner through all the steps of puppyhood. So we start with crate training and house training. We work into the challenges of teething, and then we go through adolescence. Um, and then we just, you know, through that brand loyalty, we work to retain the customer into their adult years with some more I, tri- uh, product and content. I love this because I, I wrote about BarkBox in my last book, and it was BarkBox, for those that don't know, is sort of subscription-based, uh, you know, dog box. But for me, I was like, how many dog toys could you need, could you actually need? Like eventually when you get another box of like another toy, it's like at some point you got enough toys, but you guys yeah. took a different angle. It was like training advice and all appropriate to the age of the dog, which I thought is such a cool angle. Yeah. And then the puppies also go through a lot more toys than an adult dog. So of course they do. Yeah. Destroying them and they're teething. So they want to nip on everything. So they actually do go through those toys and need new ones. And we we looked at the BarkBox model, obviously, like they were the big player in the space, even when we started the company. But um, the, the thing that we noticed, especially talking to subscription box founders, is that retention rates, what they are, you know, 
these founders would, it would it's a subscription business, but they weren't holding on to the customer for an eternity. What were you, you know, hearing they, in terms of the average tenure on a, on a, on a subscription box? Yeah. So like a 10% churn rate is really good for a subscription per, box. So like per just, month. Yeah. Month, 10%. So you're churning through your entire subscriber base every year. Every year. So we figured, you know, why not focus on a, a shorter time frame and make it a really curated experience, right? Like if we can acquire a customer who's newborn two months old and we hold on to them for a full year, we're actually at the higher end of the retention spectrum. Um, and we can make it a much better process for the customer. So that's kind of the mindset we went into. Also knowing in the back of our mind that this is a very valuable customer because it's like the Disney model. If you can connect with them when they're young, you can upsell them and cross sell them into new products, new brands. And that becomes very powerful for, you know, a major brick and mortar retailer. Say. Yes. <laughs> Can't imagine. It's like the old, you know, like the Pampers, like they target the moms in, in the hospitals, right? Like they all, they want to get them hooked on Pampers, not Huggies or Huggies, not Pampers. And right. this is, I assume a similar, similar model. So how did you win customers? Cause I, you know, subscription boxes are expensive to acquire customers generally. What was your model? Yeah. So um, just to give you some background on like what our roles in the company, we started the company together. I was in charge of all um, customer acquisition, um, business development, also IT and development uh, oversight. Ariel ran all of our operations. So she was in charge of all the merchandising, supply chain, distribution. Um, so we kind of had a kind of split the spectrum on what we covered. So um, customer acquisition is really hard, especially for like a, a new company, a startup that's just getting going. It's hard to figure out. Um, for us, there were some benefits and challenges um, with, with the way we positioned ourselves. So because we were focusing on puppy, we were like very targeted in this niche. Um, so it became both more difficult in the sense that we're, we can't use like the spray and pray model per se. Sure. But it also became... Um, beneficial to us because we could really target our marketing strategies to bring us our target demographic, new puppy owners. So we used a lot of like inbound strategies. We developed a lot of training content. We focused a lot of energy on organic social, working with influencers who had puppies um, so that people would see the product kind of in the wild. And that would then drive this targeted prospecting group to our site. And that would allow us to then just really hone in on that smaller group of people. Um, so again, it was kind of a blessing in disguise as we, as we started down this very niche, niche market path. And when you got someone to opt in for some training content, for example, did, did you call them to get them to subscribe or was it all email? No, everything we did was digital and it was, it was interesting. We actually built our website to essentially be a giant lead, uh, lead, lead engine. So when you land on our website, it asks you about your puppy. It asks you your puppy's name, and then it, it pushes you directly from essentially any call to action on the site into this profile process where we're asking you your puppy's name, gender, birthday, physical characteristics, allergies. And a lot of the time, people don't like these longer funnels because they feel it creates friction. But we found with our customer, because they're new puppy parents, they're so excited about having a new puppy in the house. Like we could really get them to engage with this profile process and then give us their email at the end when they create an account. So we'd essentially drive all of our traffic into this, this lead acquisition funnel. Um, and then we could follow on with all of our email marketing. So we had a lot of drip campaigns. We had, you know, that were lead nurturing campaigns. We did a lot of promotional stuff. Um, and we were able to, you know, convert pretty well and all that. Can I just say, I love the fact there's a dog barking in the background. <laughs> it, yeah, like it could be like an audio that you piped into there. <laughs> We'll make that makes perfect. that makes one of us. It's it's actually it, because we've worked at you know in the pet industry for so long now. It's just become very normal. And all the calls that we're on, there's always some animals in the background, some ambient noise. Yeah, nice. I love it. Okay, so digitally native inbound marketing strategy convert off the back of the funnel. Uh, capture the email at the end once they've sort of bedded into the process of profiling a little bit. Okay, I yeah. think I. I think I got it. What kind of conversion rate were you getting from initial profile to becoming a, a paid subscriber? So um, I think our overall site conversion rate was in like the four to five percent range. What, but, what does uh, that mean, overall we, site conversion? That's overall site conversion. Yeah. And then 
Um, if we could get someone to fill out their profile, give us their email, that jumped up to like 20%. So we're converting 20% of people who would actually like engage with the brand. Okay. Obviously, I should caveat, like the inbound stuff was what we really focused on in the early days. That, I think that lays a really good groundwork and helps develop the brand. But then obviously, as we were looking to scale, you have to really layer on a lot of the paid strategies, which we did, um, focusing primarily on paid paid social and, you know, some search. Got it. That's helpful for sure. At, at, at what point did you decide to go on Shark Tank? Was there a trigger, Ariel, that that you thought, okay, Shark Tank's a great strategy? So we were in 500 startups at the time, and we met somebody who said, hey, I know a producer. Does anyone want to go on Shark Tank? And we thought, well, yeah. Perfect. Great. Of course we do. <laughs> so uh, we did their long process of making a video, and uh, it took a couple months. It was kind of grueling and then we actually got on which was great in our video pitch we promised we said if you if you let us on the show we will bring puppies on the set with us and when we got our first call from the producer out of the blue they said were you serious about bringing puppies on the on the show and we we're like yeah let's do this so and that's how we got on we made it happen. so paint the, for folks who were not able to watch the episode now we're all going to go google it or youtube it or whatever but if, if we weren't able to watch it paint a picture as you walk out of the doors, onto the set. Who are you with? What's accompanying you, et cetera? It was, it was nerve wracking. So we walk out there. We had gone to a dress rehearsal the night before and they, they want to make sure that you're going to do it okay. And we totally blew it. Not the sharks, just the just, producers. Just the producers. And Ben forgot all his lines, yeah, was... which he had never forgotten them before. I, had, I was the one who forgot them, but I actually did well. Uh... And um, so we thought we weren't going to get on. We thought we won't, we won't get a call. So at 1130 the night before, they said, be hair and makeup ready by 5 a.m which they do your hair and makeup. So it was kind of weird that they said to do that. Um, it's just intimidation. Right, it was just intimidation. But we got there and it was really surreal. You walk out and it actually looks like the show because of the lighting and the way they're sitting, they're kind of far away. Um, and it was completely nerve wracking. We set our, and they make you sit there for 30 seconds and just stare at everybody uh, because they are fixing the lighting. And that's very awkward. So I, I fixed eyes on Lori as she's very nice. Um, and then we started, we set our pitch and then it became very conversational and we both relaxed and it was really fun. We were up there for about 80 minutes, I think, out there for 80 like minutes. an hour, I think, yeah. Hour, even somewhere in there. Wow. Um, the sharks were... Because on TV, it's really short, right? Like yeah, it's like seven 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah, they down 10 to 12, I think, is what they cut them all down to. But they told us the, the pitches typically range from 45 minutes to a little over an hour, and then they'll cut it down to 10 to 12 minutes. So they definitely chop it up a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we made, we, luckily we didn't forget. I didn't forget the lines of our like first two minute pitch, you know, like I'm Ben, this is my wife, Ariel, and this is our dog, Maggie. We, we nailed that. And then, and then, yeah, it just became like this. It's like people were asking us about our business that we knew. We knew our business well, really so we could answer well. all the questions. Yeah. So, they so were let's... arguing back and forth, and they would they would ask us a question and wouldn't let us finish the answer, and then another shark would ask a question. It was, it was kind of crazy, but it was very fun. Let's talk about the numbers, because I think I think you were asking 250 grand for 10%. Was that the ask? I think that was the ask, and we landed at 250 at 15 at fifteen percent, so an implied valuation of around a million six or a million seven, somewhere in that in that range, right? Yeah, got it. Okay, and and roughly, what was what was your revenue at that stage of the game? Like, I think we were, were like a little over half a million dollar run rate. I th and when you say run rate, you mean uh, annualized annual recurring revenue? Yeah. Annual, so I yeah. think we were I think we were at fifty to fifty to sixty monthly recurring revenue. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. That's super helpful. So kind of a three X on annualized recurring revenue. Yeah. Was, was the implied valuation. Okay. Yeah. That's super helpful. We had raised a little bit of money before shark tank. We were in 500 startups as Ariel mentioned, which is an accelerator program, but they actually invest kind of in your seed round. And we had raised a little bit of money from family and friends. So we had, you know, we actually had a more aggressive valuation prior to going on Shark Tank, but talking to the producers, you know, they're just like, this isn't the Valley. These, the sharks are individual investors. They want to make sure they're getting a good deal, yada, yada, yada. And 
you know, for us, it was, we were going on the show. We wanted to work with the shark. So we were, we, we went in knowing we would be flexible. Um, and so, so yeah, it all, it all worked out well. Got a lot it. of the deals, a lot of the deals you see on the show don't close afterwards. So there's a whole due diligence period after you leave the tank. You know, obviously these are invest professional investors. So they go through all the numbers. Um, they make their requests. They, uh, you work through term sheets. And then uh, I think like 50 to 60% of the deals actually fall through. We actually did end up doing a deal with Robert. So we worked with him um, all the way up until, until recently, actually. Got it. Got it. What was the most surprising thing Robert asked for in the due diligence phase? <clears throat> um, I think, uh, well, <laughs> one thing that had surprised us is he wanted a board seat and we didn't feel like it was enough money to warrant a board seat. So, um, so that was a bit of a sticking point. And we, we actually negotiated away from that and we actually ended up taking less money at the same valuation. Um, and, and it worked out for all parties because, you know, they ended up asking for a little bit less and, and it, it really worked out for us, you know, because we still got him as a partner. Why didn't you want Robert on the board? Well, we didn't have a board at the time. So, you know, we didn't want to go through it. If, it it's kind of hard if you have a single person on the board. So that would have entailed us then also going out and trying, trying to raise more institutional capital, get filling out the board. It was, it was a whole, you know, that, that becomes a strategy in and of itself. Um, and it, it wasn't something at that time that we were sure we wanted to do. And honestly, that's, we didn't, we ended up, you know, getting acquired super early instead of raising multiple rounds of venture capital, um, further diluting ourselves, building a board. We, you know, we, we decided to go with kind of the acquisition approach. So. Yeah. I want to get there for sure. Ariel, you focus more on the operation side of the business as, as you grew beyond just you and Ben, can you talk about how you structured the company so that it, it could work without you and Ben? Like, did you create procedures, processes? Like, like what was, how did you structure it so that it could kind of grow beyond just you two? Uh, it was a struggle. Um, we definitely, at, we didn't have as many processes. We didn't have uh, a way of doing things. We just, you know, hustled to get things done every day. And as we brought on, we brought on um, Savannah, who works with me. She was our operations manager and she helped make a lot of processes. And, and we made like a tracking sheet for all the, the shipments coming in and just little things. We, we've been making little changes every week since we started that just make everything more efficient. Um, so it's been, now it runs very smoothly. We have uh, a, large, a large operations team and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how we, we, we've kept this team fairly small, but it runs very efficiently at this point. It's like, what's the oh, terms like eating a whale or something like that? You have to kind of do it in chunks, right? It's like, yeah. you, we don't know what the right processes are until you get to a point where you need them. So it's like, you do them as they come. And, and for us, it was always, you know, we try to run this business pretty lean. And so we didn't raise a whole lot of capital and we were able, we hired people when we, had the cash flow to hire them. We built new processes and automation as we had kind of the uh, the ability to do so. And and it's amazing to look back now that we're whatever seven years in to see how many processes, how many employees, because it feels like you're doing things the same as you did them day one. <laughs> it's actually, I think the best thing that happened was I had to go on maternity leave at Petco. I, when I had my first child, we we still owned the company, so there was no maternity leave for me. I was there like every single day. Um, and then when I had to go on maternity leave legally and I wasn't allowed to open my computer, I had to figure out how to have other people do my job for three months. And it was terrifying. And um, we did it. And that's, and so a lot of processes came from that. What sort it's of definitely a learn? Sorry, go ahead. No, you were going to say it's a, it's a learned skill. Tell me. Yeah, more about I that. think it really is a learned skill. It's something that both of us are very can do type of people. And so when we see a problem, a lot of the time we would prefer to just tackle it ourselves because we, you know, we can get it done faster or easier or whatever. But, you know, to, I think your larger point in your book and stuff is that's not, that's not really the way to do it. You need to build a company for scale and you need to be able to set up processes and, 
um, relinquish some of that control in order to really like reach full potential. And it's something, honestly, as, as you know, young entrepreneurs, we've learned over the course of building a business that's now, you know, pretty substantially large. Yeah. Yeah. Ariel, when you went on maternity leave for the second time, what were some of the, like the highest priority things that you wanted to create process around? Um, ordering product. We do a lot of ordering, um, merchandising. Yeah. The yeah. merchandising was really big because I, I am very passionate about what I put into the boxes. I want to make mm -hmm. sure that the customer it's the customer is always first. Uh, and that's something I think about every day is, you know, if I was the customer, what would I want my, what would I want to see opening the box and what would I want my, the shipping to look like? And, and so uh, a lot of times people just look at the numbers or the weight of the item or the, the, the price. And so I just getting that passion into somebody else was what I was most concerned about. Everybody did a great job. It was fine. Ben helped a little bit. I was um, there cracking the whip. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, and then also just the vendor relationships, uh, just, just keeping up on all that. And, and so I just, I had people shadow me and, and just taught them for, I think it took me a whole, almost a, you know, six or seven months to get everything ready. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Like as soon as you know, you're having a kid, you started the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now I don't have to do as much of that because I've put all those things in place and now I have other, I have a lot of people on my team and they, they do a great job because I finally learned how to teach people how to do it. Yeah. So you scale this business first on organics uh, inbound, and then ultimately you moved to paid social, like I'm assuming Instagram was a major channel for you guys, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. And so you're placing paid ads. And, and so what did, what did Robert bring to the table other than his checkbook? Like <laughs> what, what did you leverage beyond that? We, so his team was really helpful. They were always, you know, a call or email away. And the one thing they helped us with probably the most was just PR, getting our name out there. So they got us some placements in Forbes and Inks and some, some major publications, which, I mean, don't get me wrong. Those things don't drive significant acquisition at scale, like at all, but, but it is good for the brand to get out there, um, to get you some more visibility. Um, and that was really something since, you know, he is in show business too. Is like that was very much in their wheelhouse, and that was something they helped with. And when you charged people for a subscription, were they paying each month, or did you give them a break if they bought an annual subscription? We had uh, breaks for longer subscription terms. So when we first launched the company, because we were also you know working primarily off cash flow, we had a different pricing model where we would uh, charge people upfront for the entire term. So if you sign up for a year, you pay the full $300, but it's a discounted rate versus if you're paying monthly. We actually changed that um, several years ago, but we changed it so that we would, um, you could lock in a lower price at a year, but you're still paying monthly. Um, so that's what most people opt for. We were really able to change the dynamics of the business by doing that. Because with a subscription business, really what you're trying to do is lower the barrier of entry to get them in the door. Um, and so, but then also maximize retention, right? So if you're pushing everyone into a one month subscription, you might be lowering the barrier of entry because it's you know a single month they have to opt in for, but you're gonna see a much higher churn rate because those people aren't, um, aren't as engaged with the brand and they're not, they're not like locked in. They're not, even their mentality is not in it for the long term. So when we made this shift, we, we pushed a lot more people into our six and 12 month subscriptions. Um, but because they were able to pay monthly, we could actually drive a lot more volume there. So we saw our acquisition go up. We also saw our retention go up. And that was actually a major unlock for the company's uh, growth. Um, yeah, we have mostly six and 12 month subscriptions and now. now. The yeah. one month is the least popular. Yeah, now it's like, I think, I think 3% of our subscribers opt for the one month option. It's essentially non-existent. Hmm. And the other 97% are, are using the- We have one, three, market. six, and 12. So uh, six, and, six 12. and 12 is probably half of our subscription base or more. 12 is by far the most. And then it's kind of split almost evenly between three and six. Got we it. see different dynamics for each of the different plans. Like we actually have better retention on our six month plan than our 12 month plan. Because with our 12 month plan, sometimes we get a lot of people who are just looking for the lowest price. They are- you know, whether it's they want to pay a low monthly price or they're using a discount that drives them to the 12 month plan, you get a lot more of that type of customer, the deal, deal hunters. Whereas our six month plan has by far our best retention because it's a very intent driven selection. 
you know, you, you select six months. I think your mentality is you're in for six months. You're willing to play a little bit more, but, um, but that's, that's kind of what we've seen, which is always interesting to me. And what happens at month seven? On the uh, so you automatically renew for another term. So if you're on a six month term, you automatically renew for another six months. Um, but if you cancel, you know, before that six, the first six months is up, you just are done. Got um, ha- you know, yeah. business to consumer uh, subscription models are are really tough to get them to, to honor the lock in contract, right? It's a bit of B2B. I think it's a little bit more common Definitely. that you can sort of enforce a contract. Business to consumer, it, it can be tough to enforce it. How did you enforce the longer term commitment? I mean, I think we also, we don't want people to get boxes that don't want them. So putting the customer first again, it's like if they don't want the box, we're not going to force them to, to keep it. So it's actually very easy to get out of our, to get out of it. We, we've built a long process and flow to try to retain the customer. You know, if they're on a 12 month plan and they want to opt out after month three or four, you know, we say, Hey, why don't we switch to our six month plan? You have two more months left. They say, no, I still don't want that. We offer them, you know, the month to month option at their 12 month price. So we have this whole tiered system to really try and like meet them halfway to see what it is we can provide them to, to get a better experience. A lot of the time it's a product issue too, which we always try to address. So if a dog is tearing through toys, we say, well, why don't we add a tough toy option to your box? So you're only getting tougher toys. A lot of the times that's all that's needed. So we have this long involved process to try and just win over the customer. If the customer just says, no, I just don't want it or I don't have the funds, then yeah, we just kind of release them into the wild. I think it's it's right. What you said is right. It's it's harder to retain customers in the B2C model in, in general, especially if they're trying to get out of that lockout period. But at the same time, it's it's often a lot easier to acquire them. So it's it's kind of this trade-off where you're able to drive a lot higher volume at a lot lower customer acquisition cost, um, kind of knowing that your lifetime is X, whether it's six months, 10 months, 18 months. And as long as those unit economic work, comparing your customer acquisition cost to your lifetime value, you know, nothing else really matters. You just want to maximize that, that ratio. What was your customer acquisition cost? Um, it's fluctuated over the years. I don't think I'm probably not supposed to say, so I probably will leave it okay. at that. But um, ours was really low for a very long time. It was very favorable. Um, organic when you are on the inbound organic model? I mean, even when we were focusing on paid, we were able to keep our customer acquisition costs very low and our unit economics were really favorable. I think we had a four or five X um, return um, from- When you say four to five X, are you talking about like LTV to CAC? Yes. Long-term value, lifetime value mm-hmm. to customer acquisition costs. So you started at four to five. And, th- and that of course is, you know, a lot of investors say, well, that's great in the early days, but how does that scale, right? Like, it, 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 and so you found that it, it started to, Get more it, it ebbs and flows. So as you start to spend more money, your CAC is going to go up, right? Because you're driving more traffic. A lot of it is um, traffic that maybe is is less valuable than than what you would have gotten further down funnel. Um, but as you continue to spend, if you continue to lean into that spend, it starts to even out because you start to find things that work and then you focus more attention on those and stop doing the things that don't work. So as you scale, it's just about these putting these building blocks on top of each other um, to see what works and what doesn't. Because yes, as you spend more money, your CAC goes up, but you can start to mitigate that as you get better at that price point. Um, I think that the problem is that some companies are so overfunded and so focused on inorganic growth that they plug so much money into marketing that their unit economics come completely out of whack. And I think that's more a model of like a broken capitalization system with venture capital than it is, you know, true marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's growth at all costs and you can afford to spend as much as you're making on a customer, then yeah, it's going to be expensive. And how did you finance it? Because after Robert invested his whatever, a couple hundred grand, sounds like a little bit less in the end. Like I'm assuming you're still needing to raise capital to fund the growth. What was the model there? Yeah, I mean, well, after that, we we had raised some money, so we had some money, and it drove our drove our growth. And when we kind of got to this impasse, and we realized we needed to raise more money to continue to fund the growth, and that's actually when we approached Petco. We decided we wanted to look for more strategic investors and less institutional investors. Um, and we had a conversation with Petco. Uh, we we knew that we could be a good feeder feeder program into 
you know, dog food into a lot of their other business lines, training services. Um, and so we actually asked them to invest as a strategic, they have made some investments in the past that they were not all that excited about. And so they ended up saying, you know what, I think we'd rather just acquire you guys, bring you on internally, even though it's early, we'll be able to fund this business internally, leverage resources across all of the different uh, departments um, and really stimulate more growth doing it that way. So that's actually what we opted for. How big are you at this point when you started initiating the conversation with Petco? Um, I don't think I can say that either, but we were we were in the millions. Got it. Think. Okay. Okay. So significantly bigger than than when you went to the Shark Tank. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd say. Yeah. And we were acquired almost exactly a year after our first, after we aired. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So you were on a fairly steep growth trajectory. Yeah. Ever trajectory. since we launched, we were, we were, you know, growing pretty exponentially. And even to this day, I mean, since we were at PECO, again, we were able to fund the business just internally off the, you know, PECO balance sheet. And we, we were able to grow really significantly. I think we've, we've grown, I don't know, a lot. 30 X in the last three, four years, 30 X. Wow. So wow. yeah, it's, it's pretty sizable business at this point. And, um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's all been, it's not organic, but we've always worked within our means. We have always had a really good unit economics and, you know, Petco being a profitable business looking to drive EBITDA dollars, they didn't want something that was just going to throw a lot of money out the door. So we were able to able to scale the business really in a healthy way. What was your reaction when they turned the tables on you and said, you know what guys, like we'd rather actually acquire you than invest in you. It was awesome. (laughs) I think it was, I think we had mixed emotions. I mean, we were like, do we want to do this this early? It was just like a he plan. said, she said episode. Like, yeah. she's like, it was awesome. And Ben's like, ah. Yeah, I think it was though. It was, it was awesome. You know, it, it, this is our first, Ariel had had a company previously that she exited, but this was like our first major potential exit. And as entrepreneurs, we knew we wanted to continue starting and scaling businesses and getting a successful exit under your belt. Um, is one looked really favorably upon when you go out and raise capital or, or whatever you do in the future. Um, and two, it's, it's a huge learning experience. I mean, now that we have this full lap around the track, it gives us a lot of perspective on corporate America, on how to capitalize a business in the right way, how to grow a business in the right way, um, how to structure unit economics, frankly. Um, a lot of stuff that we, we didn't have, I don't think we would have had that hindsight had we not sold the company because it allowed us to, to see a lot of different things. We're a lot more experienced now. For yeah. sure. What do you mean by unit economics? So I think, uh, you know, one, I, I like you, I'm a huge fan of recurring revenue models. I think it's kind of the only way to build a business is to get drive customer loyalty and get, you know, recurring revenue from the same customers. Um, and so I think you need to build into the unit economics, that customer acquisition cost component have some sense of how much it's going to cost to acquire a customer, what your payback period looks like, you know, how you're going to fund the business if the payback period is long and you need to grow. Um, I think all of those things really came into view more and more as we were continuing to scale because they don't get easier. They get harder, (laughs) right? You have to acquire more customers. You have to, you know, going from call it 10 million to 20 million is a lot harder than going from half a million to 1 million. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's, it's something you need to think about early on and often people don't. Got it. Let's go back to Petco. So you're, the tables get turned and you're like, Hey, we think we're going to acquire you. What happened next? I mean, did they go, what do you want for the company? Or did you say, well, that's interesting. Why don't you put together a term sheet? Like, what did you, what did you, how did you respond to that offer? That, that, uh, kind of ran the show on it. Yeah, they, they had a ballpark they presented us with very early, say this is kind of where we are, even before looking at your numbers, just knowing knowing kind of what your what your revenue is and um and what you guys are doing and the value, you know, the two of you and your team brings. And so, you know, the ballpark was was in a place where we were comfortable with it. You know, again, we we had a small child. We were essentially working and paying ourselves very little for a long time. So so it was something that we we could chalk up as a win and we were happy with. And so from there, it kind of just started down the due diligence process, diving deeper into the numbers, um, getting to a term sheet, and then negotiating that term sheet. 
Um, it was brutal. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. The, the acquisition process was brutal. It was long and involved. It was not a large acquisition, like in the larger scheme of things, you know, you see these acquisitions in the billions or hundreds of millions. It was not there and it was still just as painful. So, um, it was a long process, a lot of lawyers, a lot of back and forth over minute details that you would never even think about. Um, and in the end, it, it all worked out. The, the deal structure was, you know, cash plus an earn out plus um, equity stock and, um, and, and, the, they put in there. and salaries and, and a full employment package too. That goes along with the earn out. So, so we had to talk through all of these different components and hindsight's 2020 again, it, it all actually worked out really well um, because we were able to hit all of our benchmarks. Um, but, but it was, it was an involved process. And then we thought we thought the stock would be useless, so we didn't even, when they told us that we thought, well, this is basically worthless. We're not going to. They are private equity owned, so we're thinking like, they needed a liquidity event in you know a few years. So I was like, well, that doesn't seem like. So we didn't much. even consider that as real money, and then they actually did go public right before right yeah. Ben left. So yeah. That, that, so it worked out. It worked out. <laughs> Got it. So Petco at the time was privately held. The equity that you were offered was in a privately held company. Therefore, it had no liquidity. And that was, you discounted it for that reason. Correct. It was like not, yeah, got it. I think it happened to do anything. So what was their initial, I mean, if we can talk, I know we can't talk specifically, um, although the dog would like us to. <laughs> I know we can't talk specifically about actual numbers, but it, can we can we talk a little bit about multiples of revenue or multiples of EBITDA if, if, it, if it would make sense that was the initial sort of offer like when the ballpark that they sort of said worth looking around X. Yeah, um, so we we were valued on a multiple of revenue, um, which was nice. We had uh, we had some profitable quarters, but no profitable years at that point. So like working on a even a multiple was just not in the cards. Um, and it, they didn't, they didn't discount us for that, which is nice. They knew we were a quickly growing subscription business. So like EBITDA is very hard to come by, um, especially when you're, when your focus is scale. And so, um, yeah, the ballpark they threw out was a, you know, a, a revenue multiple and that's kind of where I'll leave it. But, um, knowing what our revenue was, you know, we got, we got a revenue multiple and, um, it was within the range of what we thought was reasonable. And so we kind of negotiated back and forth and with the other additions they were able to include, um, such as, you know, the, the stock and the salary and everything else, we, we figured we'd give it a go. We had, go it. We, had, we had goals to reach that we'd get more, which we did reach our goals. Which yeah. yeah. I want to get into that for sure. Um, so the multiple, it, the Shark Tank multiple, was around three X. And again, I don't know if, if, if you can say or not, and just say, I can't tell you, I can't say that, but I'm more, I'm assuming it was kind of, it, it was somewhere in that neighborhood. It yeah. Like we, can't more, or? It, it, we can't say specifically, but it was in that neighborhood. Got it. Okay. That's, that's great. So, so it's, it's being valued as a subscription company, a multiple right. of revenue. And, uh, and that makes total sense. And it was a, a hybrid. And again, tell me if you can't say, but I think people would be interested to know, sort of proportionally speaking, if you had the whole pie and we think about the pie as being, you know, cash, earnout, stock and salary, could you put some round numbers percentage wise to, to those get ballparking? Um, yeah, I guess it was probably... 75% cash and earn out and the, ma yeah. the majority was salary and stock. And then the, the, the minority, the rest of the rest yeah, of it, the 25%, yeah. Yeah. the rest of it. Sorry. And then, um, the, uh, of that 75%, uh, I think like of, of the cash component, I think 70% was in cash and 30% was earn out. Got it. That's helpful for sure. And the earn out was tied to your revenue or, churn rate or how did they, what, what did they tie the earnings? Yeah, it, it was tied to revenue targets over the course of a few years. And how did you ensure you would get the budget to finance the growth in order to hit the top line revenue targets? That's actually really interesting that you point that out because we were talking about that this morning. Um, we, 
did he not. did not do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, we had, there was another company that was purchased at the exact same time as us. And we have become very good friends with, with that owner. He did put in his contract that he would get a certain marketing budget in order to keep growing. And we didn't. And at one point the company needed more EBITDA dollars and they did cut our advertising budget right at Black Friday, right in December. And we were, oh, wow. we were like, oh my God, I can't believe they did this. Well, you know, it's going to be a nightmare. And he didn't, he said, legally, you have to give me the marketing budget. And so we, um, we got through, we were fine, but um, that we're, we thought we should have put this in the contract too. Why didn't we think of that? But there were a lot of like little things like that, that we, we hadn't thought of because it was our first time doing this, that uh, next time we will think of. I think what else? Are- Someone that I just- Someone told me earlier is you should get a, a coach or someone who sold a business before when you're selling a business it's really important to have someone who's done it before really help you look around these corners and see these things that we didn't necessarily do. Someone told me that during the acquisition process, I kind of blew them off. And in hindsight, that is really good advice. You should find someone who's been through the ringer with this before so that you can, uh, you can see these things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's so important. We talk a lot about, uh, you know, the, the analogy of Sully, the guy who landed the plane on the Hudson river, he never had a chance to do it. Uh, it, you know, he never had a chance to practice it. And, and right. for a lot of entrepreneurs, that's, that's what it's like to sell a company, right? Like sure, you, right. you have no idea what you're doing and, uh, it's helpful to have somebody guide you. Ariel, you were going to say there were two or three things that you might do differently. One of them would be to lock in the budget contractually to meet your advertising budget. So that's one. Are there two or three others that you might share? Like, oh, I wish I'd known that before I went through this yeah. process. I think another thing I would have done is, uh, which, which our counterpart, uh, the other guy did was he had asked for a VP title. Um, we didn't ca- could care less about titles. We're not trying to c- climb the corporate ladder at all. We're trying to build businesses and sell them. Um, and so they made us co-general managers and not VPs, which was co- just about at the VP level. And we were, we're structured you know, just, just one step away from the two steps away from the C- CEO. But, um, in, in a corporation, your title, it's like the military, your, your <laughs> title matters a lot, uh, whether things get done, uh, the respect people give you, uh, bonuses, you know, all these things that I didn't, I had no idea because I had never worked in a corporation before. Uh, hindsight, I would have asked for that VP title. That's really good advice. What else? Um, Keep a thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> why do you say that corporate america can bang you up pretty good i think uh you know it's there's a lot of competing priorities there's a lot of different business units and while when you're running your own show you know you're kind of the king or queen of the castle and you are dictating what matters and what doesn't as soon as you're part of this larger entity you know while you're all fighting towards the same goal there's a lot of infighting to try and get resources, to try and get attention, to try and get um, marketing exposure, um, and frankly, just dollars, budget. So um, you, you kind of have to, having a good sense of that component of corporate America definitely would have helped um, early on. I think so we learned, we're, we're quick, quick studies. So we picked it up. I think the planning of, you know, how are we going to integrate? How are we going to work in the grander scheme of Petco? Uh, it was just exciting at the time. You know, we have all these ideas of how we can help Petco and how Petco can help us. Uh, but, but everyone is incentivized for their department, for their, you know, the, everyone wants Petco to do well, but they have their own agenda. And so having the buy-in from other departments and, and talking to you know, talking to someone for marketing or talking to, to someone for merchandising and actually figuring it out, okay, is everybody on board, not just one person? You know, how is it how are we actually gonna get integrated in do, doing this? I don't know if it's feasible for that to actually happen before an acquisition, but it would have been nice. Did you try to drum up an offer from Pet Value or Pet Smart or any other sort of direct competitors to Petco? No, that was, no. that was another point of advice. The person who told me that I should get a, uh, a coach to help sell the business also said, you are going to have zero leverage unless you have another acquisition offer. If you have another acquisition offer, I don't care what it is, um, you can really drive up the price. It's something that we did not pursue to the extent we probably should have. Um, 
But yeah, if you are in a place where you're ready to sell your business and you're shopping it around, even if you can get that second offer, you can start a bidding war and it, it, it really can drive up the price. And we knew that. I mean, we did know that. We knew yeah. that we didn't have, uh, you know, a good alternative. And so they kind of had us. Um, but we also were running out of money and we were really excited about, you know, Petco was in San Diego and it was, we were excited about what they were doing and we, we wanted to be part of it. So we thought, well, let's just do it. And, and not, you know, keep this thing, you know, try to find something else because who knows what would have happened to the, what would have happened to the offer. Raising money is really hard too. And we, we, we were not huge fans of the venture capital landscape at the time. Um, we didn't know if we wanted to take venture capital, private money was drying up a little bit. So, so it was, it was kind of our, our best move. What advice did you get from Robert in the process of negotiating with Petco? Robert being the Shark Tank superstar. Yeah. I, I, he actually episode. did. They did pass on some, he passed on some advice and I actually, I can't even remember. This is bad, but I can't even remember what it is at this point. I'd have to go back and look. Um, but they were really supportive. You know, they said, whatever you need from us, we're here. Let us know. Let us know if there anything comes up that you want us to review. They were really supportive during the whole process. Um, and honestly, from an investor standpoint, that's sometimes the the most you can ask is, is for them to be kind of the silent investor who's there to support you versus the more vocal investor who, who wants, wants something um, for themselves. So, so that was really great. 500 startups was also very helpful yeah, and supportive. They were very founder friendly. We talked to them about the numbers. Um, we renegotiated our, our uh, deal with them at the very end as well about how much they would get from the deal. And they were, they were just, just a pleasure to work with. Um, they were super supportive and excited for us. So I, I'm very pleased with that. What was your justification for renegotiating their terms with 500 startups? We, we, they, was, they had a, we just, we had a convertible note with them that hadn't yet converted. And so they had like a, like a preference of multiple um, on the note that was more than they would have gotten for their equity share essentially. So we, we, we just negotiated with them to, to take essentially their, their equity share and, and it worked out well. And we had said, you know, if we don't, our reasoning was if you keep it the way you are, the way that it is, it, it wouldn't be a great acquisition for us and we might not do it. Mm, I see. Said, well, we don't want you, you know, we want this to be a you know, good experience for you. You know, we don't need to take more. That's fine. Got it. Can you explain what a convertible note is? Yeah, so it's just a it's an investment instrument that when when investor invests with a convertible note, they're putting in essentially debt on the company, um, and then at a later stage, whether usually it's a, a, the next fundraise, it will convert at a specific valuation that's set on the note. So if you have like a four million dollar cap, will it will convert at that that cap? Even if you raise a ten million dollars, will convert at four, so they get their valuation at four, and it's just it makes it. It streamlines the investment process because there's not nearly as much legalese or paperwork as actually selling units or shares um, because it's just an instrument of debt. Um, but it typically does have verbiage and language in there that it will accelerate um, based on a liquidity event. Um, and there's, you know, a million parameters that, that can be impacted. And, and why didn't it convert when Hershevik invested through Shark Tank? Because that he was also invested with a note. Oh, he did. Okay, yeah. it was a convertible note, and, and there was a threshold. Did. There was a threshold on both of the notes that uh, first it had to be a, a funding round of I think a couple million dollars or something for them to convert. So, so all of the investment that we had at the time were, were convertible notes. I see. Okay, and for a new entrepreneur who's just discovering convertible notes for the first time, what advice would you have for them in structuring them? Um, just, you know, go over them with your lawyer and just make sure you understand like what everything means and how it all works. I think they're really great because they can speed along the process quite a bit. Um, but, but definitely understand the acceleration, um, what it means if you're to sell the company. Um, you know, there's oftentimes preference, um, which you have to, you know, watch out for. And then, um, you know, obviously the valuation where, where the cap is set, if there's a discount on top of the cap, which is also uh, customary. So, so there's a, a lot discount, of those. And a discount would be basically on the valuation that the institutional investor was investing in. A discount yeah. would be 
So if you had a $4 million cap, but your round was at a $3 million valuation, they would essentially get, you know, a discounted rate, something like that. Got it. Got it. That's super helpful for sure. So what's life like now? You've got obviously pets in the background, <laughs> you've got kids. And so how has life changed now that you've sold this business? It's dramatically changed. Life's good. Life is good. Um, <laughs> Life is definitely good. We, I feel like we are experienced entrepreneurs at this point. Um, we're, you know, working on other, another company. Uh, I feel like we, we know what we're doing this time. Uh, it's way easier to raise money. Um, easier what, to- do you want to just give a plug for the new company or? Yeah, sure. So um, I just left Petco a couple of months ago. Ariel's still there, um, kind of finishing, transitioning things over, but um we're starting a new company called Cloud Water Filters, and essentially, it's a direct-to-consumer water filtration brand. Um, every everything is digitally native, and it's really baked in that premise of the recurring revenue model. So, our first product is a reverse osmosis system that's installed under your sink. Um, every six to twelve months, you're going to get refills for those those filters. I love it. Yeah, and. Um, and because we've got one of those Nimbus things, but like, yeah. where do you get the refill? I know. Right? It's and really like, a problem. So it's also a remember mechanism. like to do it and, and oh, it's late. Hard. And so it's dirty water. It's a mess. And yeah, this so it's, really it's, a lot, it's a connected device as well. So it hooks up to your phone to let you know that it's working. And then based on the usage, it actually triggers those replacements versus just, you know, you remembering or setting up some arbitrary timeline that you don't understand. Um, it actually is sending the data to, to your phone saying like, hey, your filters are, are low. We're just going to auto ship you new ones. I love it. I love it. I got a weird question for you. Sure. You guys both seem like really switched on, really smart people who I'm guessing could get a job. <laughs> You've had a job now for a couple of years at Petco, but I like just hearing you talk, I, I think there would be a lot of big companies that would love to hire either of you. Have you ever sat back and looked at the opportunity cost of entrepreneurship? and said, we invested X number of years in our life in this startup, and we had a Y return from that. Had we gone to work at Apple or Google or IBM, we probably could have gotten X. Have you ever done that sort of cost benefit or, or like, you know, the opportunity cost? Yeah, we, like, we, we do it a lot, but I think we fall oh, really? on the, of the spectrum. It's like, yeah. we, we see the opportunity cost of not starting another business. It's, you know, I, I have a, a buddy, a business partner for cloud, he always says, I, I like to work for chunks, not checks. You know, it's, it's if, you can, if you can do this right and you can have an exit in some liquidity event, you're always going to make more in the end. So I think there's a huge opportunity cost for people to, you know, kind of take the complacency to, to, to be complacent with where they are, what they have. And, and you know, it's like if you're going to risk money in the market or in real estate, in our minds, like we might as well risk it in ourselves. Like we think we're smart people. A lot of our friends probably don't, but. <laughs> I mean, we had, our earnout period ended in January. And at that point, that's when Ben decided to leave. And I also decided, you know, I'm, I'm only staying for a little bit longer. Um, and we were working for these, for the rest of our earnout. And once that ended, it's like, well, what are we doing here? We make a lot of money in it for our salary and we get stock and we get our bonuses and blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's still, it's checks, not chunks. And yeah, it's a nice, it's a very comfortable life. Uh, we can, you know, afford things, but it's not exciting because we're not really building anything. So we want to want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's, it's definitely hard. It's also, you know, some people are okay working for other people and some people aren't. And I'm definitely of the art. Arters. We're not very good at it. We, we, ben, there's a new replacement for Ben who's running Pup Box now. And so she's, you know, I, I need her because she's going to you know, take over when I'm gone. But it's very hard having somebody else, you know, making calls Step and deciding things. And it's, uh, it's weird. So I'm excited to be my own boss. Well, I, I think there's great things to come from, uh, from Cloud Water Filters. I think that's an awesome new uh, business. I can't wait to follow that. Uh, I'm so grateful for you guys doing this. Where, if people wanted to reach out, is there, uh, do you take LinkedIn requests or like what's the best yeah. way to, uh, to reach out? LinkedIn's easy. Um, you can also just, you can also email us, obviously. Um, 
we, you can do Ben at cloudwaterfilters.com or Ariel at cloudwaterfilters.com and definitely uh, have your listeners check out the site. It's, um, it's going to be launching early next year. We're just uh, in production now, manufacturing the product and the site's live and I think it's, it's worth a look. So feel free to reach out if there's any questions for us personally or, um, or about the business or anything. Cool. And, and Ariel and Ben have a unique spelling of their surname. So I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, just go to built to sell.com slash, ah, oh, geez, I should know this blog radio. <laughs> <laughs> you'll find it. <laughs> it it's, uh, it's there and you'll, yeah, you'll see it. And, uh, yeah. and that'll be included in the show notes, including both LinkedIn profiles for you guys. So listen, I'm so grateful for you sharing your story with such candor and humility. I love it. I can't wait to track the next, uh, the next business. Thank you for doing this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, if you like today's episode, you're going to love my new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. The book was inspired by the cohort of my guests over the years who have been able to negotiate an exit far better than the benchmark in their industry, sometimes two or three times more than I would have expected. I was curious to understand the tactics and strategies of these entrepreneurs and what they do differently from average performers. The result is a playbook for punching above your weight when it comes to selling your business. To learn more, go to builttosell.com slash selling, where we put together a collection of gifts for listeners who order the book. Just go to builttosell.com slash selling. Built to Sell Radio is produced by Haley Parkhill. Our audio and video engineer is Dennis Labataglia. If you like what you've just heard, subscribe to get a new episode delivered to your inbox each week. Just go to builttosell.com. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.